Hey, my name is Matt Storr, and I repair saxophones for a living. Today, I would like to show you the Buffet Super Dyne Action Tenor Saxophone. Um, and most of what I say is going to apply to the alto as well. Um, there are baritones and even some sopranos, uh, but you barely ever see those. Most often what you're going to be seeing are the altos and tenors. Now, this particular saxophone that we're looking at today is original finish, overhauled by me, uh, and it's a 1971. Buffet made the Super Dine Action from 1957 until 1975, um, and the serial numbers range from about 4,700 to about 22,600. So that means they only made 18,000 of them in 18 years. Uh, you can compare that to 180,000 Mark VI's made in 20 years at about the same time. Um, so they made only about a thousand of these a year. Buffet is mostly known for their clarinets, but uh, from the 30s through the 80s, they also made saxophones um, and their handmade French instruments. They're really gorgeous uh, and they're very well made and they play very well and they uh, are a pretty good bargain too. Um, and they stopped making them just because they weren't really selling very many. I mean, they only made a thousand a year. That's not uh, a whole lot of saxophones uh, to hand make, and it's just not very profitable. Um, so they stopped making them in the 80s, although they've recently started up again, uh, working in conjunction with Kyle Worth, who is now owned by Buffet Group. They're making a new saxophone patterned on uh, the Buffet S1, which is the model that followed this one. So this is the Superdyne Action. And you will see that engraved on the back of the body tube on a Superdyne action. And the serial number is in a slightly odd spot. It's underneath these keys down here for your low uh, E flat C. Um, so this saxophone has single post construction. And what that means is that uh, instead of having ribs on the body, like a lot of modern saxophones and a lot of saxophones made around this time, there's only one post with a single foot for every post on the instrument, right? So it's just the body of the instrument and then these posts are soldered to it. And they look pretty substantial when you look at them, but um, I find that oftentimes on these instruments these posts are pushed in, particularly this one up here. Um, it sticks out so far and you've got so much mass on it and it, if it gets hit it's going to push a dent into the body here. Um, and it's not too difficult to get out, but that's something to watch for. Uh, another thing that you'll find is that the bell to body brace, while very substantial looking and very pretty, the body side of it has a fairly small foot and it's right in between the uh, G and G sharp tone holes. And if the body takes a hit, it pushes this brace into the body pretty bad there and you'll have a dent and you'll need to unsolder this, push the dent out and resolder it. Um, and usually at that point the body will also be bent uh, from that push. So that's also something to look for if you see one of these for sale. Um, other than that, I mean that those are really the only two kind of craftsmanship or construction things to look out for. Um, these are very well built very, um, you know, they're basically the same from one to the next. There's not a whole lot of variability. The key fit is very good. And the models stayed basically the same from uh, when they were introduced in 1957 to when they were phased out in 1975. The model previous to this was the Dyne Action, which is very similar to the Super Dyne Action. Um, and the model following was the S1. But within the Super Dyne Action run, uh, the saxophone that they were competing with was the Mark VI which was kind of the go-to saxophone uh, at that period. I mean, they made 180,000 of them and sold them in 20 years compared to 18,000 of these. But that's the saxophone that this was meant to compete with. And the Mark VI is known for being a really great all-around horn. And the Buffet Superdyne Action is one of the few vintage saxophones that I think uh, comes close to the Mark VI in terms of its flexibility of tone and the uh, different environments in which you could use it. The only place where it probably lacks in comparison to the Mark VI is going to be, um, it's not a very punchy horn. 
The tone is really beautiful, really, really beautiful. The intonation is excellent. Um, they are plenty powerful when you push them, although a lot of times you hear people say that they feel kind of contained or that they're not very powerful. That has not been my experience. Um, I think that a lot of that may have to do with key heights. If you look here, okay, so two things to notice about the keys. One, the tone holes are actually in line. By the time that this instrument was made, uh, Selmer was offsetting their tone holes, the right hand stack and the upper stack, so that you're hands were a little bit spread, which is a little bit more comfortable. Uh, Buffet kept the tone holes in line, but they moved the pearls off the key cups on the right hand stack. So functionally it feels very similar. Um, and although this is a you know vintage horn, it has key work that feels really modern. And most people, this is kind of like an introductory saxophone to the vintage world. Most people who've never played a vintage horn, um, this is one of the first ones I put in their hands. And everyone's always very surprised at how easy it is to play and how much it feels like a modern horn, how comfortable it is. Um, you know, but they get the added benefit of a richer, more beautiful tone than say perhaps uh, a Yamaha, which does a lot of things awfully well, but I wouldn't say that Yamahas have the most you know, richest and most beautiful tone out there. Um, so, one of the things that the construction of this instrument is kind of interesting. If you see, the bottom turn here is very tight. There's not a whole lot of room between the body tube and the bell tube. And because they don't have these uh, keys offset at all, you basically have your right hand stack keys opening right into the mechanism for the low B and B flat. And there's even See if I can get it to focus here. A cutout. You gonna focus for me? A cutout in the key spine for the D, so it can travel up as far as it needs to, and not hit the key barrel for the low C sharp. Um, and as you can see, I mean my fingers are almost like inside the key work for the bell keys on the right hand stack here. Um, and although it might look weird. It actually, you don't really notice it in playing, but as a technician, it's kind of disconcerting to set your tone hole, or to set your key heights so that the key work is so close to the um, bell tube. But really, this is about what you need. Um, this is the way they came from the factory. I've seen several of these with original setup. Um, and this is how I set them up. And I also use flat resonators. If you use really domed resonators, you need to open your key heights a little more. Venting is very important on these. Uh, and getting the venting correct is going to have a lot to do with whether you have a horn that speaks very well or whether you have a horn that feels stuffy or contained, as a lot of people uh, say these horns feel. And I think really a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're keeping these heights a little closer than they would otherwise, just because it feels more comfortable from a repairman's point of view uh, to keep the fingers farther away from this mechanism. But that's just the way it's designed, that's the way it is, and in practice, once you get it set up, I mean, it, you know, you don't like hit the keys with your fingers, unless you've got really, really weird um, playing habits, it's not going to get in the way. But So your key heights need to be fairly open, and that goes for the low C as well. You can see that's pretty open, the low B and B flat. You can see what my heights look like on the upper stack. Um, but once you get those key heights to where they're supposed to be, these horns really speak easily and well, and they do have a lot of power. And they're also very mouthpiece friendly, which um, is super handy, because not a lot of vintage saxophones can take either a old style mouthpiece or a modern mouthpiece and play well in tune, except these can, um, which is another quality they share with the Mark VI. So they share an awful lot of qualities with the Mark VI, like I said, with the exception possibly of a punchy tone. I wouldn't describe the tone as punchy. It's dark, it's luscious, it's fat, it's beautiful. It's a really, really gorgeous tone, um, but I wouldn't say it's punchy. And you could play this in uh, pretty much you know any setting you would want, from classical uh, through jazz. And you know I wouldn't be surprised if someone put the right mouthpiece on if they played it in rock. Although uh, to my knowledge, there's not a lot of people doing that. But there's not a lot of people playing these horns because there's not a ton of them out there. Um, you know, if 18,000 were made, there's probably 15 or 16,000 still around, which is just uh, not very many. Um, that's about as many horns as there are for, uh, like, what would that be? The balanced action, which is a pretty rare horn to see. So, um, 
we've gone over the body brace, the key heights. Sometimes you'll see, especially on the later ones, they've got a high F sharp. So you've got the, the key here, you've got some extra mechanism coming up through here. The unusual thing is that the tone hole for the F sharp intrudes onto the neck tenon. There's actually a hole cut out here. And then on the neck tenon side, there's like a cutout so that when you insert the neck into the body, it doesn't impede on the tone hole. Um, and it looks pretty weird, and it, it honestly it feels pretty weird to use, although it seems to work fine. My only issue is that if you've got a cutout for like about half the distance of this tenon here, then that part of the body, you've only got this much tenon keeping uh, airtight. So you'd have to be really careful uh, to make sure that your neck tenon is not leaking. But I think that's only on the later ones, not on the earlier ones. You also find uh, that, especially the earlier ones, not so much the later ones, instead of the springs being in cradles in the keys, they actually go through holes. So you can't adjust the springs as the without taking the horn apart. And when you're putting the horn together, you have to make sure that the springs go into the holes before you uh, insert the hinge rod. Otherwise, you're just going to have to take it all apart again to get the screws in. So, um, tensioning your springs is not something you can do while the horn is together on some of these. Um, and I think on this one, like most of these have gone to cradles, because this is a slightly later one. But like the C-sharp and the F-sharp have spring holes, so you have to adjust these. And you know, if you want to adjust them, you have to take the keys off, adjust it, put it back on, and see if it's where you want it to be. Um, some people sometimes have trouble working with the octave mechanism. Let's see if this is focusing. Okay, so there's the octave mechanism. Um, and you can see the way this rocks right here. And what you, what do you have to do if you want this to work right? So you've got your body octave key right here, and then this piece is hinged, and then there's your long octave rod. And this is the G, so when you open the G, the neck presses here, opens that key. What you have to do is you got to make sure that this octave key is completely free. Uh, no play, but completely free. Same thing with this key. And make sure that the angle of this arm into this receiver here... Come on, focus. ...is correct. And that what I've found works best is to... Uh, have a piece of adjustment material inside that cradle there. And what I use is very thin laminated cork, um, laminated with Teflon, and there's no play in there, so there's no noise, there's no clickety-clackety, but it's very smooth. Um, it's operating under its own very light weight right now. And as you can hear, it's pretty quiet. It's got the uh, cradle side keys which I usually just wrap the uh, stem of the side keys in some synthetic felt and you get really nice quiet action. The only noise you're really hearing there is the pad work. Um, the left hand pinky table is somewhat like a balanced but it's also got some sliding linkages like on old horns like from the 30s and before so when you depress your low B flat here You've got, it's kind of hard to see. Hmm, what's going to be the best way to show you? Okay. So you see those arms there. They're actually sliding against like a little uh, stem coming off the low B and low B flat. And getting that to feel good uh, can be somewhat difficult. You just have to make sure that you've got absolutely like no play between the uh, top motion so where the keys come to rest these keys aren't like bouncing or moving around and that's uh, controlled by a piece of adjustment material right here and make sure that you've got something firm but also slick and quiet on these arms here I actually use uh, very firm natural felt on this and I find that that does a really good job. But you, if you don't get this right, 
the left hand pinky table is going to feel really really bad. So you've got to get your spring tensions right for these keys which is going to be pretty light. I mean if I put the horn down you can see they're fairly slow but no one plays the saxophone like this. They play the saxophone like this and when it's like this it's plenty fast. Another thing that you got to get right on this left hand pinky table is the low C sharp. The way it's built, it's probably never going to feel super great, but it doesn't have to feel bad either. So you've got your long C sharp rod here uh, that pushes down the G sharp as well. Follow the action down. You've got uh, cradle and stem, one, two, and then the C sharp key. And getting this so that it moves freely, but also doesn't make a ton of noise and doesn't feel really gummy under the fingers. Um, you've just got to have everything really precise and really, really, uh, there's just no margin for error. If you want the C-sharp on these horns to feel anything less than really bad, you've got to spend some time on that. Um, and the pinky table in general, it's very easy to make it feel pretty bad, but if you spend a little bit of time, like I said, this is one of the horns that I give to people who've never played a vintage horn, uh, and they pick it up and play it and they don't notice, they don't complain. Um, not only does the slightly different layout not bother them, but the action doesn't bother them, if you do it right. But that's probably the most difficult thing to do as far as repair on the whole horn, um, is get that left hand pinky table right. And I would say, you know, schedule yourself, if you're doing the work on these horns, schedule yourself, you know, several hours to work on the left hand pinky table if you want to get it right. Because especially the first time you do it, um, you're just going to have to go back over it and back over it and back over it and just don't stop until it feels really, really good because it can. And that's one of those things, you know, the left hand pinky table is one of the things that kind of like, you know, um, is one of the major differences between vintage horns and modern horns. And people who aren't comfortable with vintage horns, a lot of times it's a left hand pinky table they're talking about. So if you don't do the left hand pinky table right on this one, it feels bad. And then people say, oh, it's just one of those vintage horns that I can't play. But that's not true. It has the ability to feel, you know, every bit as good as almost anything else. So get your key heights right. Make everything nice and quiet. Get your octave mechanism so it works really slick because it can work really slick. I mean, you can hear right now. It's not making any clicks or clacks. No extra noise. Same thing with the side keys. Nice quiet horn. And it feels really good under the fingers. Um, and one of the, I mean, the, one of the best things about these saxophones is that it's just such a great value. You can get an alto for between like $1,200 and $2,500, and you can get a tenor for between like $1,500 and $3,000. Um, this one being almost mint condition uh, with a fresh overhaul on it um, is towards the upper end of the value spectrum. But you can get ones that have a few scratches and dings and dents on them with a fresh overhaul for, you know, $2,500 for a tenor and $2,000 for an alto. And of course you can get them for much less than that if they don't have an overhaul on them and then take it to a repairman you trust that does good work on vintage horns. And you've got a killer vintage saxophone that's going to hold its value, probably go up in value over time as people realize what fantastic saxes the, uh, these are, um, for, you know, a quarter the price of a uh, competing Selmer with a very similar sound. It's also a French handmade horn. Um, and the craftsmanship and quality is excellent on these. They're just really, really great. So I think that's about it as far as the Superdyne action goes. Um, did I go over everything? Did the octa mechanism, did the key heights, uh, did the left hand pinky table. Oh, this is really close. Oh, um, so you may notice on this saxophone, I'm not sure if it's showing up, but there's kind of like a sparkly appearance to the lacquer. And if you do a Google search for buffet sparkle lacquer, you'll find some people talking about what they assume must have been a finish option from buffet, uh, where the lacquer kind of has a sparkly effect to it. But if you look really close to what is actually going on here, what it really is, I think, is crazing. Okay, C-R-A-Z-I-N-G. And if you look that up, like for pottery finishes, um, that's when different layers of finish or 
material don't dry at the same rates and one of them shrinks and kind of you know crackles like um, like shatterproof glass and you get that effect on the horn and uh, some of these buffets have that effect in the lacquer this one included uh, and it seems to be m like more desirable but I'm I'm not convinced it was an actual finish I've never found any uh, evidence that it was an actual finish. It's never mentioned in any um, you know paperwork. I've seen these with original warranties and booklets and it just says lacquer on the finish. It doesn't say sparkle lacquer or any sort of special lacquer finish at all. Um, so I'm fairly convinced that this is just I mean you know bad lacquering by buffet that just happened to have a really really beautiful outcome. Um, but you'll still see stuff that's advertised as sparkle lacquer, but I'm, I'm just not convinced that that's an actual finish. I think that's just a happenstance. They, you know, either had their lacquer too thin, you know, mixed uh, with too much thinning agent, um, or they dried it too fast and they got a crazing effect. It does look beautiful though, and it seems to be every bit as durable as the other lacquer. Oh, and that's one more thing, is that the they changed the lacquer during the run of these saxophones. And um, the later ones have a much uh, clearer, yellower, like kind of modern Yamaha looking type lacquer. And the older ones have a much darker kind of honey brown lacquer. And the older stuff, um, I think, is nitrocellulose based, meaning it's a bit lighter, it's also a bit more fragile. The later stuff seems to hold up a lot better, um, but it's, it's, it seems to be much thicker and it might be epoxy based. I'm not totally certain because I haven't stripped one yet, but that's what it looks like to me. And as far as does that make a difference to the sound, I mean, I think there's a lot of other factors that are probably going to affect it first, like is the horn in good shape and does it have a good overhaul on it? Um, and those two questions, unfortunately, the answer to them is not yes as much as it should be. Um, so I would worry about that before you worry about which type of lacquer you've got in your Buffet Superdyne Action. And like I said, they don't seem to change very much throughout the run, although some of the later ones have that high F sharp, which um, works fine. If you like a high F sharp, go for it. If you don't need one, uh, it's probably less variables uh, to not have one on there. So um, search for an earlier one or a later one that didn't have that option. So. There you go, the Buffet Super Dyne Action, built by Buffet Crampon from 1957 to 1975. They're excellent, excellent saxophones. They are a particular bargain if you're looking for a vintage saxophone with modern ergonomics, uh, modern intonation, a uh, flexible tone uh, that can be used in almost as many uh, different environments as the Mark VI, which is probably its closest competitor in tone. Um, but uh, for much, much cheaper than equivalent Mark VI. These are still, uh, you see these for sale quite often, and um, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I think people are, are getting wise to them, but uh, I still you know, have several of these per year that I fix up and sell, um, and uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. So if you're looking for a great all-around saxophone without breaking the bank and without uh, worrying too much about whether... Uh, the vintage ergonomics of something older, like say a Con 10M, is right for you. Try a Buffet Superdyne Action. Um, and if it feels clunky under the fingers, it doesn't have to be. It just means it's not set up right. Um, so try and concentrate on the tone if you test one and it feels clunky under the fingers because the clunkiness is not part of the horn. These are really slick, really great feeling. And um, I've owned several of these myself. Usually, when I own a tenor, I own a Buffet Superdyne Action. So, I hope you found this helpful, useful, informative. My name is Matt Storr. I repair saxophones for a living. If you've got questions, concerns, comments, leave a comment here. Email me. Call me. Um, just don't stop by unannounced because that would really freak me out. But thanks for watching.